أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين بارئ الخلائق أجمعين باعث الأنبياء والمرسلين ثم الصلاة والسلام على خير خلقه العبد المؤيد والرسول المسدد حبيب إله, العز... حبيب إله العالمين أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين وصحابته المنتجبين واللعن الدائم على أعدائهم إلى قيام يوم الدين صلى الله عليك يا أبا عبد الله صلى الله عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي يا ابن رسول الله يا رحمة الله الواسعة ويا باب نجاة الأمة ويا عبرة كل مؤمن ومؤمنة يا مظلوم يا غريب يا شهيد كربلاء يا ليتنا كنا معكم سادتي فنفوز فوزا عظيما أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وجعلناهم أئمة يهدون بأمرنا وأوحينا إليهم فعل الخيرات وإقام الصلاة وإقام الصلاة وإيتاء الزكاة وكانوا لنا عابدين صلوا على محمد وآل محمد A second for the love of Imam Al Imams Al Hassan and Al Hussein. A third salawat with for the love of Fatima Al Zahra with your loudest voices. One of the things that all Shia scholars agree upon and take it for granted meaning that there is no question about it is that the Imams of Ahlul Bayt had a special status they were not ordinary people they were not like the rest of the Sahaba or the Tabi'een or the early generations of Muslims definitely they stood out they stood out in their knowledge in their piety in their akhlaq in their, self -self, in their self sense of sacrifice and their sense of self-giving, and so on and so forth. Pick anyone you want from the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, and compare him to anyone you want from anyone else, from the Sahaba, from the Tabi'een, and from the Sunni Imams. Are our Imams comparable to anyone else? No one compares to them. Not in their knowledge, not in their piety, not in their infallibility, in none of their status. They are incomparable to anyone else. Was Imam Ali السلام, an ordinary person? Look at his life. Study his life. From his birth to his death. What was ordinary about Imam Ali? 
his strength, his courage, his generosity, his worship, his knowledge, his bravery in battle. What was ordinary about him? Which one of the other Sahaba could compare to some of the virtues of Ali ibn Abi Talib? And not all of the virtues of Ali ibn Abi Talib. None. This is agreed upon. And I think not just our scholars, but other scholars from other schools of thought would also agree with us on this issue. Yes, there are some that insist that your Imams are no different from others. Why do you give a special status to Ali ibn Abi Talib from the other Sahaba? Why do you give a special status to the rest of the Imams? What's so different from Imam Sadiq than Abu Hanifa, for example? And a Shafi. There are some that say this. There are some. But those that are true to themselves and true to others and are true to God, they admit that our Imams stood up and were different from others. Our Imams are infallible. They're infallible. Infallibility means they're sinless. They never committed a sin. They never thought of sinning. Infallibility min entails perfect knowledge. Our Imams had knowledge of the truth. They were not mujtahids. They knew God's commands and God's laws and what was required of them and what was required of, of others as well. The difference between the Imams of Ahlul Bayt and others is that the Imams were infallible. They enjoyed infallibility while others we're not infallible. So, ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Several years ago, many years ago, at the Husseiniyya Irshad in Tehran, Iran, a scholar by the name of Dr. Muhsin Kadivar gave a series of lectures during the month of Ramadan, specifically on the night of the 23rd of Ramadan, and on some of the nights of Muharram, the month of Muharram. He gave a series of talks on the status of Imam Hussein salam and the rest of the Imams. Imam Hussein because it was during the month of Muharram. And the rest of the Imams because Imam Hussein is an Imam. So whatever you say about Imam Hussein, you would have to say about the rest of the Imams. And his topic was regarding the historical Imamah and how Imama and the status of being an Imam has been, view, has been viewed from the times of the Imams up till the current period. The evolution of Imama and how it's been perceived. Right? And how the companions of the Imams and their contemporaries, how did they view them? Did they view the Imams the same way that we view the Imams today? Or did they have a different view of the Imams? Now briefly, just a little bit about Dr. Kadivar. Dr. Kadivar is a mujtahid. He's a jurist. He studied for many years in Qom. And he was a student of Ayatollah Muntazari. Ayatollah Muntazari. And he gave him, he issued him an ijaz of ijtihad, a license of ijtihad. Then Dr. Kadivar moved to the West. And specifically he came here to the United States. And he began teaching at Duke University, I believe in North Carolina. Until today he's here. He's in North Carolina teaching. Well, I don't know where he is now because of the flood. But he lives in North Carolina teaching at Duke University. Dr. Kadivar, he gave a series of talks. And he supported a theory called Al-Ulama Al-Abrar the righteous scholars. Now the origin of this theory is not Dr. Kadivar. The origin behind this theory is Professor Hussein Mudarrasi at Princeton University in which we'll get to in a little bit. This theory is called Al-Ulama Al-Abrar, righteous scholars. What does it mean? Just a brief summary and then we'll go into detail regarding this theory and what are the arguments for and against this theory sallallahu alayhi muhammad wa muhammad a brief summary and this is what dr kadivar 
stated at Husayniya Irshad and Tahran. And by the way, Husayniya Irshad is very well known. Shaheed Murtala Mutahari, he would lecture there. Dr. Ali Shariati, he lectured there. Some of the most prominent intellectuals in Iran would give their lectures at Husayniya Irshad. Is it still there in Tehran? Is it open? I don't know. But this is this was in the in the seventies and in the eighties and in the nineties. A summary of this theory is that today we view the Imams differently than what their contemporaries viewed them. Today we give too many qualities to the Imams. This is Ghulu. We exceed the limit. We give divine qualities to the Imams. For example, we claim that the Imams have knowledge of the unseen, ilm al ghaib, just like God. The same way, the same way that God has ilm al ghaib, has knowledge of the unseen, so too is the Imam. So to the Imams. Also, we ascribe to them infallibility, sinlessness. They are error free. They don't commit sins. We claim that the Imams are just like the Prophet. They are allowed to legislate laws. They can make something haram and they can make something halal. They have the, the right to legislate. For example, Imam Sadiq stated that in four places you have the choice of bet between praying full and praying qasr in Masjid al Haram. In Al Masjid al Nabawi, or in Mecca, rather, because some jurists they say it's not just Masjid al Haram, in Mecca, in Medina, in Masjid al Kufa, and in Al Ha'ir al Husayni, under the dome of Imam Hussein. Now, this, this didn't exist at the time of Rasulullah. Imam al Sadiq, he legislated this. He says that the Shia of today, they believe the Imams have the right to legislate. And they perform miracles and all of this. So they have knowledge of the unseen, they perform miracles, they have Ilm al Ghaib, they can do all of this. While the companions of the Ahlul Bayt while the companions of the Ahlul Bayt did not view the Ahlul Bayt with such. Sallallahu alayhi Muhammad wa Muhammad. For the brothers coming in late, you might catch me off guard. You know, and this is the problem of coming late. I apologize for complaining. But the problem is, when you come in the middle of the lecture, you hear parts of it, and then you say, wait, the Sayyid said that Imams cannot perform a miracle. This is not what I said. This is a theory that is being proposed by a scholar, right? And we're trying to refute it. So this is my only problem. I apologize for putting you on the spot. Sallallahu alayhi Muhammad wa Muhammad. Dr. Kadivar, Dr. Muhsin Kadivar, he says that all of the things that we ascribe today to the Imams, this didn't exist at the times of the Ahlul Bayt. Look at the lives of the Imams and look at the era after Al Ghaybat al Sughra. At that time, the Imams were viewed differently as we view them today, completely differently. So we have to take this into consideration. The Imams were viewed, were viewed as righteous scholars and hence the theory is called Al-Ulama Al-Abrar, righteous scholars. The Imams were simply viewed as righteous scholars, just like we view our maraja' today. How do we view, for example, Sayyid al-Sistani? He's a righteous scholar, he's a good scholar, righteous, God-fearing, with piety, and he has a lot of knowledge. This is the way that the companions of Ahlul Bayt, they viewed the Imams. They viewed them the same way we view our maraja, Righteous scholars, not more. They didn't ascribe to them miracles, or ilm al ghaib or the ability to legislate laws. None of this, right? Dr. Kadivar took this theory from Professor Hussein Mudarrasi at Princeton. He was the one that came up with this theory. And Dr. Suruj, Dr. Abdul Karim Suruj, who we spoke about yesterday, he also 
is critical of the way today we view the Imams. And he says, this is not the way the Imams were viewed in the past. In the past, the way they viewed the Imams was in a simplistic way, not the way that we view them today. So before we continue with Dr. Suru, uh, Dr. Kadivar's argument, he took Professor Mudarrisi's theory and he developed it. So we have to say something about the theory of Professor Mudarrisi. Ayatollah Sayyid Hussein Mudarrisi studied in Iran. He studied in Qom under Tom Juris. And he studied under Al-Alam Al-Tabatabai. And then he moved to the UK. He received his PhD from Oxford. And then he moved to the United States. And he began teaching at Princeton University. And he's been at Princeton for over maybe three decades. Perhaps three decades. Professor Mudarisi is an, is an elderly gentleman, but he's highly respected. A highly respected scholar who has... His students are now highly respected professors everywhere. And I'll mention two. One is Professor Intisar Rabb at Harvard University, who was a Sunni Muslim and she became a Shi'i Muslim at the hands of Professor Mutarasi. She's a highly respected teacher at Harvard. And the other is Professor Khalid Abul Fadl at UCLA in Southern California. These two scholars who are acclaimed scholars, they're students of Professor Mudarasi. Professor Mudarasi in 1993 wrote a book called Crisis and Consolidation in the Formative Period of Shi'ite Islam. And this became a groundbreaking book with groundbreaking research. This book was about Ibn Qida al-Razi. Abu Ja'far Ibn Qida al-Razi. Who was Ibn Qida al-Razi? Ibn Qida al-Razi was a highly respected jurist at the time of Sheikh al-Tusi. So we're talking about approximately 11 centuries ago. Approximately 11 centuries or maybe 12 centuries ago. Ibn Qib al-Razi, who is from, you know, he's known as al-Razi. Ibn Qib al-Razi, most likely from Nishabur, was known for a theory in Usul al-Fiqh. He's only known for a theory in Usul al-Fiqh that consolidates between apparent laws and actual laws. How do apparent laws and actual laws go together? What do I mean by this? I'd like the brothers and sisters to pay attention because this is very, very much in detail. We Shia, we believe that there is a law for everything. And a jurist can reach that hukum and he may not reach that hukum. So when a mujtahid says that this is wajib, he's either hitting the bullseye or he may not if he hits the bullseye perfect he will receive two rewards if he doesn't hit the bullseye and he misses the actual law that's also fine he's safe and we're safe for following him and hence لل مصيب أجران ولل مخطئ أجران واحد if a mujtahid reaches the actual law he gets two rewards. If he misses the actual law, he gets one reward. So we have actual laws that God ordained. And there are apparent laws that we find in ar rasal al amaliyah that could meet the actual law and they could not. And this is called At-Takhta'a wa taswib We, followers of Ahl Bayt, we believe that there is an actual law. We could miss it and we could aim at it. We could reach it. We're called mukhatta'ah. Mukhatta'ah meaning we could reach the actual law and we could miss it. While in the Sunni school of thought, they believe in taswib, generally speaking, of course. Generally speaking. And there are PhD dissertations being written about this, by the way. Takhta'ah, taswib. My nephew, Sayyid Hadi al-Qazwini at USC, his PhD thesis is on this. Al-takhta'ah wa taswib. Generally speaking, in the Sunni school of thought, they believe in taswib. 
that every jurist will hit the bullseye. He's reached God's actual law. Now, put this aside. I don't want to confuse you. And this theory of Ibn Qiba, that how do we consolidate between actual laws and apparent laws? He says, how? Does that mean that every individual has two laws? He's obligated with two laws. One is the actual law. God's actual law. And the other is the apparent law. Let me give you an example. Let's say that the actual law for Salatul Jum'ah is that it is haram during the time of Ghid. For, for example, this is not it. And by the way, this was an opinion. Shaykh al-Saduq, his opinion that during the time of Ghayba, Salatul Jum'ah is haram. Only an infallible Imam can lead Salatul Jum'ah. And if the mujtahid, he reaches the conclusion that it is wajib. That means the mukallaf, now Salat al-Jum'ah is both haram for him and wajib. So how could this go together? Here, jurists, they try to find a, a solution. Can Consolidating, making it compatible, the actual laws with the apparent laws. Now let this, let's put this aside and let's come to the real theory of Ibn Qiba that Professor Mudarasi tried to support it, his argument with. Muhammad wa Muhammad. Ibn Qiba Razi, one of his views is that the Imams, they're not infallible. They're not ma'sumi. They are righteous scholars. They are God-fearing, pious scholars. Ulama abrar. Nothing more than that. They're not infallible. No. no. And Ibn Qibar Razi, although he believed he rejected infallibility, he still respected. Shaykh Atusi, for example, in, in his book Rajan, when he writes the biography of Ibn Qibba, he respects him. He says he was one of our greatest scholars. And Najashi as well. They didn't condemn him. I said, SubhanAllah. Previously, some people were more tolerant. As time passed by, we became less tolerant. Today, if one Mawlana, if one person says something, the world goes upside down, immediately we call him a kafir, we call him this and that and that. We become less tolerant. Previously, our scholars were a lot more tolerant. Shaykh Al-Tursi, Shaykh Al-Mufid, they would sit with Sunni scholars, they would debate them, they would speak with them. With all respect, there was no takfir. We see the takfir today. Anyhow, Ibn Qib razi a highly respected scholar, believed in this theory, ulama, al ulama al abrar, that our that our imams were righteous scholars; they were not infallible. According to Professor Mudarrisi, that because some scholars at the time they remained quiet, they didn't object to Ibn Qibar Razi. That means they too accepted this theory, including the Nubakhtis, some of the Nubakhtis. Like who? Who's included in Al-Nawbakhtis? al Hussein ibn Ruh, the third Safir. He's part of the Nawbakhti family. al Hassan ibn Musa al-Nawbakhti, who we talked about a couple of nights ago, who wrote Al-Firaq, Firaq al-Shia, the sex of the Shia, for the brothers and sisters who were there. He's from the Nawbakhti family. Professor Mudarasi claims that the Nawbakhti family also accepted the theory of the righteous scholars. Salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Now, this is what Professor Mudarasi stated in his book, Crisis and Consolidation. The book is available, you can purchase it online. Professor Kadivar, Muhsin Kadivar, he took this theory and he developed it even more. In some of his lectures, as I said, at Husseini, Irshad, and Tahran. He says that indeed, today we view the Imams differently as they were viewed historically at the times of the Ahlul Bayt. The early Jews, right after Al-Ghaybah, Al-Ghaybah al-Sughra, or even before, they didn't view the Imams the way we view them now. We ascribe to them miracles, we believe that they believed in Alm um, al knowledge of the unseen, and so on and so forth. No. No, no, no. They had a simplistic view of the Imams. For example, and this is whom? Professor Kadivar. He's 
He's the one that elaborated on the theory of Professor Mudarasi, Hussein Mudarasi, Hussein Taba Taba Mudarasi. He says, for example, you have a scholar by the name of Ibn al Junaid, Abu Ali Ibn al Junaid, one of our earliest theologians and jurists. He believed in Qiyas. That's besides the point. He believed in Qiyas, just like Sunnis believe in Qiyas when there's an analogy. You could, analogy is part of the juristic system. You could derive laws through analogy. That's, let's put that aside. Ibn al Junaid, one of his views was that our Imams were mujtahids. You might say, well, that's good. Right? They're mujtahids, and it's good to be a mujtahid. No! For an Imam, that's an insult when you say he's a mujtahid. Why? Because he means it means he's struggling to know the truth. Ijtihad means you're making a struggle. You're making an effort to know the truth. While the Imams, they did not need to... This is what we believe in today. That the Imams did not need to make a struggle to reach the truth. They already knew the truth. A mujtahid, like I said just a couple of minutes ago, he could reach the truth, he could hit the bullseye, and he could miss. This is what Ibn, Ibn Junaid believed. That the Imams were mujtahids. Right? Just like Abu Hanifa. There's no difference between Imam al-Sadiq and Abu Hanifa. And Ahmed ibn Hanbal. This is in the eye of whom? Ibn al-Junaid. And Ibn al-Junaid also was a respected scholar. If you read his biography still today, he's highly respected. He's an esteemed scholar. And there were jurists that would mention his views in their book, in their books. Like Al-Allam al-Hilli. Al-Allam al-Hilli in his book, Mukhtalaf al-Shia, a book on the various opinions of the jurists on fiqhi matters. Among the jurists that he mentions his opinions time and time again is an alam al hilli And no one can deny the stature and the status of al alam al hilli Correct? He mentions his views of Ibn Junaid. Salla ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. This is one scholar. Another scholar that Professor Kadivar mentions is Ibn al-Ghawairi, Ahmed Ibn al-Hussein, Ibn al-Ghawairi. This was a scholar in Baghdad. He was a contemporary of Sheikh al-Tusi and a classmate of Sheikh al-Tusi. Ibn al-Ghawairi has a book called Ar-Rajal, Men, by, um, Narrators. He lists the name of narrators and he says, are they reliable or are they not reliable? Can we rely on their hadith or can we not rely on their hadith? This book, by the way, in itself, it's controversial. There's definitely a book called Ar-Rajal by Ibn Ghawairi. But the problem is that the one that we have today, is it really the actual book or no? Ayatollah Khawai says no, it's not the actual book. Ayatollah Sistani says yes, it is the actual book. So you can see the amount of division there is on Kitab Ibn Ghawairi. In my humble opinion, I agree with the Sayyid al khoi and I believe that the book that we have today, it's not the original. Anyhow, Ibn al ghawairi when he comes to a lot of the narrators that narrate the karamat and the miracles of Ahl al-Bayt, or that say that Ahl al-Bayt had knowledge of the unseen, Ibn al ghawairi he says, Ghulu, Ghulu, Mughali, Mughali, Mughali. This narrator, he's a Mughali. He's, he's exceeding the limit. Ghulu? Those, we talked about Ghulu couple of nights ago when we talked about the various sects in Islam. Ghulu, that's you know, exceeding the limit with the Imams. Ibn al ghawairi in many of the narrators, he says, Mughali, 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 exceeding the limit. He would ascribe things to the Imams that did not belong to them. So this is another piece of evidence that he, that Kadivar supports his argument with. Three, in the early stages of the development of Shi'i thought, there were two major schools. The school of Iraq, represented in Kufa and Baghdad, and the school of Iran, represented in Qom. Now the Qom back then was different from the Qom of today. In Kufa and Baghdad, there was a lot of ghulat, those who ascribed things to the Imams that did not belong to them. Knowledge of the unseen, ilm al ghayb miracles, so on and so forth. While in, in Qum, the Qummi school of thought was strictly against Ghulu, was very strong against Ghulu. 
there were several scholars in Qum, they were known as the Ash'ari Qummis. These scholars, they existed, they were there in Qum, they migrated from Iraq to Qum, they were Arabic, they were Arabic speaking, they were not Persian speaking. They migrated from Iraq, from Kufa to Qum, they lived in Qum. During the time of Imam al-Rada, Imam al-Jawad, Imam al-Hadi, Imam al-Hassan al-Askari, they were there. Qum's Hawza was from that time, from the time of Imam al-Rada, was an old Hawza, right? But it was on and off. At that time, there were several scholars like Ahmad ibn Muhammad ibn Isa al-Ash'ar al-Qummi, like Abdullah ibn Sa'id al-Qummi, like Ahmad ibn Muhammad ibn al-Hassan ibn al-Walid, like al-Husayn ibn Sa'id. These were four scholars that were in Qum that were strict against Ghulu. Any scholar, any narrator that would narrate anything that exceeds the limit with the Ahlul Bayt, they would kick him out of Qum. In fact, Ahmad ibn Mu Ahmed ibn Muhammad ibn Isa al-Ash'ar al-Qummi. He was called al-Mukhraj, the one who would kick people out of Qum. And he kicked at least three people out of Qum. At least three. One of them was Sahl ibn Ziyad, and the other was Ahmed ibn Muhammad ibn Khalid al-Barqi. He kicked them out. Why? Because he accused them of ghulu. He said, you are ascribing things to the Ahl al-Bayt that the Imams did not say themselves. You're ascribing to them knowledge of the unseen. You're ascribing to them karamat. You are ascribing to them miracles. And the Imams didn't say this. They kicked them out. They were very strict against ghulu. So this is the third piece of evidence that uh, Kedivar supports his argument. Anything that they narrated that was extraordinary, if they ascribed anything that was extraordinary to the Ahl Bayt, they would kick them out. صلى على محمد وعلى محمد. شيخ الصدوق. This is the fourth piece of evidence that he brings. He says, "A Sheikh al-Sadiq believed that the first step of ghulu is to say that Rasulullah doesn't forget." He says, "This is ghulu. Don't say this. Don't make Rasulullah above human. You say that he doesn't forget. Why didn't he forget? He would forget, just like any other human being." Rasulullah would forget. The first stage of ghulu, how, do you, how can you test a person to see if he's a Mughali or not Mughali? See, does he say that Rasulullah doesn't forget or he forgets? Sahwun Nabi. Does, the Rasul, does Rasulullah forget, especially in Salah? Does he forget in Salah or he doesn't forget in Salah? If he says that Rasulullah doesn't forget in Salah, that means he's a Mughali. So this is another piece of evidence. And finally, he quotes al Mamagani in his book, Tanqih al-Rajal. Imam Ghani was a well-known scholar, and he was a professor of Ilm al-Rajal. He wrote a, a compendium called Tanqih al-Maqal in over 20 volumes. Imam Ghani, in his book, he says that some of the beliefs that we take for granted today regarding the Imams, their infallibility, their knowledge of the unseen, miracles, karamat, things that we say for things that we take for face value today, previously they were questionable. The companions of the Imams and the period after that, they questioned these things. They questioned these matters. Sallallahu alayhi wa Muhammad. Wa Muhammad. <laughs> so when did things start to change according to Professor Kadivar? When is it, where was the paradigm shift? When is it that the Shia began to believe in these things? In, in, uh, in Asma, in infallibility, in that Imams accept, uh, believe in, I'm sorry, Imams have Ilm al Ghayb, Imams could perform miracles, Imam could legisl legislate laws. When is it that the ulama began to believe in this? Professor Kadivar says during the Safawi period. During the Safawi dynasty in Iran, during the time of Shah Abbas and Shah Ismail al Safawi, they brought scholars that began to develop this sort of theory, specifically like Al Alam al Majlisi in Bihar al Anwar. It is because of Al Alam al Majlisi in Bihar al Anwar and other scholars like him that the idea of miracles and legislating laws and all of this it began to spread. But previously it didn't. And hence, in conclusion, this is what 
Professor Mudarasi, uh, Professor Mudarasi and Kabivar reached, that we have to follow the scholars of the formative period or the later period. Who knows the Ahlul Bayt the best? The early scholars or the later scholars? The early scholars, not the late scholars. Let me give you an example. Who would know, for example, Sayyid Sistani the best? Those who lived with him now and saw him and witnessed him, or those that will come 300 years from now? Obviously, the ones that saw him, the ones that lived with him, the ones that studied under him. Correct? This is their theory. Sallallahu alayhi wa Muhammad wa Muhammad. Now, our response begins now. With all due respect to the respected professors, but we disagree with this theory. And we believe that the Ahlul Bayt, they are infallible, and they have Asma, and they have a great deal of knowledge. If they don't have full knowledge of Alm al Ghayb, then they have partial, definitely a great portion of Alm al Ghayb that was taught to them by Allah, not innately. Not because they naturally have ilm. No, it was taught to them by Allah. And they did perform miracles and do, they do have legislative rights. Now, how do we prove this? How do we refute this theory? Number one, being a Shia, following, falling under this category requires two things, two beliefs. If you believe in them, you're a Shia. If you don't believe them, you're not a Shia. You're a Muslim. You're a Muslim. But to call yourself a Shia, no. One is that you believe that Allah and His Prophet, they appointed 12 successors, 12 Imams. Take it or leave it. If you believe in this, you're a Shia. You don't believe in this, you're a Muslim. But you're not a Shia. Two, that the Ahlul Bayt, the Imams that were appointed by Allah and His Messenger are infallible. They weren't just ordinary people. They weren't ulama abra. They weren't righteous scholars. They were way above that. You accept these two things, you're a Shi'i. If not, you're a Muslim, but you're not a Shi'i. It's like saying, I'm a Sunni, but I don't believe that Abu Bakr was the first Khalifa, nor Umar, nor, Abu uh, nor Uthman. I believe Ali ibn Abi Talib. Well, guess what? You're not a Sunni. You're a Shi'i. You're not a Sunni. If you're a Sunni, you believe that Abu Bakr was the first to come. And then Umar and then Uthman. If you don't believe in this, then you're not a Sunni. You're a Shi'i. And, and, it, and it works vice versa. So this is number one. Number two, we believe that there are certain individuals that were not Imams. Yet they were sinless. They were sinless. We saw such people, we witnessed some people, some of these people. We believe we have ulama, ulama that live today, and they lived in previous generations that never committed sins in their life. Is it too much to say that Ali ibn Abi Talib was sinless? It is too much to say that Imam Sadiq was sinless? We saw scholars alive today, and in the past generations, that People wrote about them books and in their biographies they never committed a sin. We have some ulama that never never committed a makruh, let alone haram. We saw this. We witnessed it. So is it too much to say that Imam Ali was was infallible? And that Imam Ali was was sinless? We have scholars like Mirza Hassan al Shirazi, the one who gave the fatwa of the tobacco. Mirza Muhammad Taqi Shirazi, the one that gave the, the, the revolution of 1920, We have a Sayyid Abdul Hadi Shirazi, we have a Sayyid Abdul Hassan Al Asfahani, we have a Sayyid Al Burujurdi, we have a Sayyid Al Sistani, who we know for a fact they never committed a sin. Ask, ask their peers, ask those who know about them and their students and their family members, they tell you they never committed a sin. So is it too much that we ascribe this to one of our Imams? I don't think so. I don't think I don't think it's too much. I don't think this is ghulu to ascribe such a thing to the Imams. This is number two. Number three. The Imams they can't have knowledge. This is the assumption. That the Imams are mujtahids, just like Abu Hanifa, their knowledge is not perfect. Their knowledge is not perfect. It's just like anyone else. 
They could reach the truth and they could miss the truth. Today, we have man-made gadgets. We have man-made gadgets that are perfect, that are accurate. You put any information and you'll get a precise answer, an accurate answer. This is a human-made gadget. Humans were able to produce a gadget that gives you a perfect answer. Is it hard to believe that an infallible imam can give you a perfect answer? Is it hard to believe? We saw some humans today that give you answers from the Qur'an, that have memorized the Qur'an and have the ability to memorize books of hadith and ask, if you ask them any question, they'll give you the answer from the Qur'an or from the hadith. And they're not ma'soom, they're not infallible. So is it hard to believe that Imam Sadiq was like this? Or Imam Al-Jawad was like this? Or Imam Al-Baqir was like this? This is something that we witness today. I'm sure you've seen, you've seen this on WhatsApp or you've, they've sent it to you. There's youth now in Iraq, in Iran. You open any page from the Quran and you read the first word. Not that they continue. They will continue reading from the seventh line. I've seen that. And then you tell them next page. They'll read you the first sentence of the first page. You flip back and they'll read you the first sentence of the previous page. There's individuals like this today. Is it hard to believe that Imam Sadiq was like this? Absolutely not. This is number three. Number four, this is very important. We must differentiate between two issues. Between a historical perspective and a theological perspective. Just because historically the theory of infallibility was not accepted, it doesn't make it wrong. And just because historically there was the theory of the righteous scholars, al-ulama al abra it doesn't make it right. We have to differentiate between what historically existed and what was right. Let me give you an example. Historically, many of our scholars, several, I won't say many, several of our scholars believe, questioned the integrity of the Qur'an. They said there's a chance that there are sentences missing in the Qur'an. Historically, this theory exists. Of course, there's a minority. Today, all of our scholars say what? They uphold the integrity of the Qur'an. They say that the Qur'an is flawless, it's perfect. They uphold the integrity of the Qur'an. If we want to take the historical perspective, today we have to say that the Qur'an, there's verses missing in the Qur'an. Or there's verses added to the Qur'an just because it existed historically. No, we have to differentiate between a historical perspective and a theological perspective. Just because something existed in history, it doesn't mean it's wrong today. Just because previously scholars did not believe in Asma and infallibility, it doesn't mean that the theory of Asma is wrong. You see? We have to differentiate between a historical perspective and a theological perspective. Sallallahu Muhammad wa Muhammad. Then we have proof from the Qur'an. Even if some of the companions of Ahlul Bayt or some of the early jurists and scholars and theologians, they rejected Asma. We have enough proof from the Qur'an to prove Asma. إِنَّمَا يُرِيدُ اللَّهِ لِيُذْهِبَ عَنْكُمُ الرَّجْسَ أَهْلَ الْبَيْتِ وَطَهْرَكُمْ تَطْهِيرًا Surely Allah wants to cleanse you, Ahlul Bayt, and purify you. What does this mean? What sort of purity? Was it a, a physical purity? Were the Ahlul Bayt dirty that they needed a, phys a physical cleanliness? No. A spiritual cleanliness. He cleaned them from sins. This verse in itself can prove infallibility. As for knowledge, as for knowledge, the Quran in one verse, one verse had answers. قُلْ كَفَى بِاللَّهِ بَيْنِي وَبَيْنَكُمْ وَمَنْ عِنْدَهُ عِلْمٌ كِتَابٌ the Qur'an says regarding Ali ibn Abi Talib, he has knowledge of the book. He has knowledge of the book. And when you have knowledge of the book, Allah says in the Qur'an, وَمَا فَرَّطْنَا فِي الْقُرْآنِ مِنْ شَيْءٍ We have brought everything in the Qur'an. So if someone has knowledge of the book, and everything is in the Qur'an, that end, the end result is what? That person has knowledge of everything. 
You see? This is regarding Imam Ali and his knowledge. And if Imam Ali has this knowledge, all of the Ahl al-Bayt have this knowledge because their knowledge was passed on from generation to generation. As for miracles, how can the Imams perform miracles? Very simple. The Quran says regarding the successor to Sulaiman, قَالَ الَّذِي عَنْدَهُ عَلْمٌ مِنَ الْكِتَابِ أَنَا آتِيكَ قَبْلِ أَنَا آتِيكَ بِهِ قَبْلَ أَنْ يَرْتَدَّ إِلَيْكَ طَرْفُكَ Sulaiman asked for the throne of Bilqis in Yemen. قَالَ عَفْرِيْتٌ مِنَ الْجِنْ أَنَا آتِيكَ بِهِ قَبْلَ أَنْ تَقُومَ مِنْ مَقَامِكَ One of the jinn told Sulaiman that I will bring you the throne before you stand. وَقَالَ الَّذِي عَنْدَهُ عِلْمٌ مِنَ الْكِتَابِ The successor to Sulaiman, Asaf ibn Balkhiya, had, had some knowledge of the book. He had some knowledge. أَنَا آتِيكَ بِهِ قَبْلَ أَنْ يَرْتَدَّ إِلَيْهِ طَرْفِ Before you blink your eye, I will bring you the throne. And he bought the throne. And he had some knowledge of the book. Ali ibn Abi Talib has knowledge of the book. قُلْ كَفَى بِاللَّهِ شَهِيدًا بَيْنِي وَبَيْنَكُمْ وَمَنْ عَنْدَهُ عِلْمُ الْكِتَابِ Imam Ali had knowledge of the book. There's a difference between having knowledge of the book and some of the book. That means Imam Ali could do what Asaf ibn Balkhiyat did and a lot more. So the proof is in the Qur'an. The evidences of the Qur'an, whether it's infallibility or knowledge or miracles or legislating laws, it's in the Qur'an. صلى الله عليه وسلم محمد Also, we have to keep in mind that some things during the days of Ahlul Bayt, they were not clear. They were not clear. That is why, if you remember a couple of nights ago, I mentioned that after the death of every Imam, a, a group would sl split. They would split off. They would reject the Imam, for example, of Imam al kadhim And there was a group that rejected the Imam of Imam al-Rabah. Today, we don't have a bit of a doubt in the Imam of Imam al kadhim And the Imam of Imam al-Rabah. But at the time they did, does that mean they were right? Does that mean that we have to accept their historical perspective? We have to follow history and see what was the historical perspective? No. There was confusion at the time. That is why there's so many sects. You have Al-Fatahiyya, Al-Waqif. Yeah, th those who attended that lecture on the various sects, you remember. There's one thing that I forgot to mention in that lecture. After the death of Imam Al-Hasan Al-Askari, the Shia split into 14 groups. Fourteen groups. One of them was the Ithna Asharis that believed in the twelve Imams. There were fourteen groups. There was a lot of confusion. But today, Alhamdulillah, we have enough knowledge, we have enough wisdom, we have enough evidence and, and proof to believe in all of the Imams. So just because something was rejected historically, it doesn't mean that it's wrong. There was confusion. There were some people that were ignorant of the truth while they lived with the Imam. Imam al-Hassan alayhi salam when he had his peace treaty with Muawiyah some of his companions would come and they would tell him As-salamu alayka ya mudhill al-mu'mineen Peace be upon you O oh, the one that disgraced the believers disgraced the Shia can you believe that? This was a companion of Imam al-Hassan he would insult Imam al-Hassan to his face and if I tell you who this was you'd be shocked he was one of the great companions Maybe some of you have even visited his grave. But their knowledge was limited to the point that he doubts the knowledge of the Imam. And what about Imam Hussein alayhi salam? Didn't some say that he was a Khariji while he was alive? This was some people. Didn't the Shia, some of the Shia of the time write him letters and churn against him? Didn't we see this? Isn't this historically proven? that some Shia wrote letters to Imam Hussein and asked him to come to Kufa. Now that he came towards them, they turned against him. And they called him a Khariji, an outlaw, a renegade. If you wanted to take this perspective, then today we have to say that Imam, Imam Hussein is a, is a Khariji. But this is wrong. Till today there are some, from that time until this time, they say, خرج الحس قتل الحسين بسيف جده that Hussein was killed with the sword of his grandfather. Meaning what? That Imam Hussein was a, an outlaw. He rose against the Imam of his time. He rose against Amir al-Mu'mineen Yazid. And he deserved to be killed. There were Muslims that believed in this. 
So just because people believe in something, it doesn't mean that they're right. Even if historically this existed. Salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. We come to Ali al-Akbar. Tonight, we remember one of the companions, one of the warriors on the day of Ashura, Ali al-Akbar. What a warrior. What a gem. Ali al-Akbar, there, there's various narrations how old we he was on the day of Ashura. One narration says he was 19. Other narrations say he was 25. And there are others that believe he was between 27 and 28. There's various views. Most likely he was 25. Why? Because there are other narrations that tell us Imam Zain al-Abideen was 22 in Karbala. And Ali al-Akbar is older than Imam Zain al-Abideen. So this makes the narration of 25 more credible than the narration of 19. It doesn't matter. How old he was, it doesn't matter. There are some that believe Ali al-Akbar had a wife and had children. He had children. Because in one of his ziyarah, we recite, we recite in a ziyarah, Sallallahu alayka wa ala itratika wa ahli baytik wa abaika wa abnaik. Peace be upon you and your family members and your noble family and your fathers and your sons. And your sons. This means Ali al-Akbar had children. He had sons. And his kunya is Abu al-Hasan. So most likely his eldest child was named Hassan. This is one view. Another view was that Ali al-Akbar did not have children. There's another perspective that says he didn't have children. One thing is for certain is that Ali al-Akbar looked exactly like Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. A man came to the mosque of Rasulullah, a non-Muslim. He saw Rasulullah in his dream and he guided him to Islam in his dream and he told him, come to my mosque. He came to the mosque of Rasulullah and he told the Muslims, I want to say the shahadatain and be a Muslim. They told him why. He said, because I saw Rasulullah in my dream. They told him, how do you know you saw Rasulullah in your dream? How do you know? Do you know what he looks like? He said, he said I saw a person in my dream that seemed to be like Rasulullah. So they wanted to confirm, did he see Rasulullah in his dream or not? They called Ali al-Akbar to the mosque. They told him, do you see this? As soon as he saw Ali al-Akbar, he said, I saw this man in my dream. Or I saw someone that looks exactly like this young man in my dream. Ali al-Akbar looked like Rasulullah. That is why when he entered the battlefield, Imam Hussein raised his hand and he said, Allahumma shahid, faqad baraza ilayhim ghulamun ashbahu nas khalqan wa khuluqan wa mantaqan bi rasulik. Oh Allah witness that a young man that is most similar to Rasulullah in his appearance in his akhlaq and in his speech and if we ever missed your messenger all we had to do was look at the face of this young man Ali al-Akbar he had foresight he had knowledge he had courage he wasn't an ordinary youth he wasn't your average 19 year old he had foresight. He knew the plan of his father. He knew what this revolution meant. Imam Hussein alayhi salam was on his way to Karbala. He passed by an area called Qasr Bani Muqatil. Imam Hussein alayhi salam was on his horse along with everyone else. Imam Hussein, while he was on his horse, he fell asleep. Khafqa. Khafqa means his, his head fell. As he was sleeping, as he was riding on the horse, his head fell. He woke up and he said, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. 
Ali al-Akbar heard his father say Alhamdulillah He told him Ya, ya Abba why do you say why, do you, why are you thanking Allah He said I saw a dream That a knight is following bet- Behind us and he's saying Al-Qawm yasirun Wal-Manaya tasiru khalfahum These people are going And death is following them So he said I realize that we're going towards death Ali al-Akbar, he asked his father, he said, Abba, هَلْ نَحْنُ عَلَى الْحَقِّ Are we on the truth? Are we following the truth? Um, he said, told him, of course. He said, إِذَنْ لَا نُبَالِي أَوَقَعْنَا عَلَى الْمَوْتِ أَمْ وَقَعَ الْمَوْتُ عَلَيْنَا Then we shouldn't care whether we go towards death or death comes towards us. This is the foresight of Ali al-Akbar. He knew exactly what he was doing. He had knowledge. He had foresight. And in the Maqatil they say that when it came towards the turn for Bani Hashim to enter the battlefield, the first person from Bani Hashim to enter the battlefield was Ali al-Akbar. And the only person whom he asked permission to enter the battlefield and the Imam did not say no was his son Ali al-Akbar. Anyone else who came and sought permission to enter the battlefield, the Imam would say no. The Imam would try to deter them. The Imam did not want anyone's blood to be spilled. Because he knew that this army was after him to kill him, not anyone else. He didn't want any innocent blood to be spilled. So anyone who would seek permission, the Imam would say, no, except Ali al-Akbar. When Ali al-Akbar sought permission, Imam Hussein raised his head to the sky, his blessed, his tears streamed towards his blessed cheeks and they came on his beard and the Imam said Allahumma shahad ala haa al-qawm faqad baraza ilayhim ghulamun ashbahu al-nas khalqan wa khulqan wa mantiqan bi rasulik wa kunna idha ishtaqna ila nabiyik nabarna ila wajhiha adha al-ghulam and then the Imam started saying a dua against this army اللهم امنعهم بركات الأرض ومزقهم تمزيقا واجعلهم طرائق قددا فإنهم دعونا لينصرونا ثم غدوا علينا يقاتلونا Oh Allah, forbid them from the blessings of the earth and divide them for they have invited us to support us yet they turned against us and then he looked at Umar bin Sa'ad and he said, قَطَعَ اللَّهُ رَحِمَكِ كَمَا قَطَعْتَ رَحِمِي وَلَمْ تَحْرِمْ وَلَمْ تَحْفِظْ قَرَابَتِي مِنْ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ May Allah destroy your kinship the same way that you destroyed my kinship and you did not respect my family members and the family members of Rasulullah. Ali al-Akbar wore his armor he put on his turban he carried his sword and he entered in the battlefield reciting ana ali ibn al husayn ibn ali nahnu wa bayt allah awla bin nabi tallah la yahkum fina ibn ad-da'i أطعنكم بالرمح أحمي عن أبي أضرب بالسيف أحمي عن أبي ضرب غلام هاشمي علوي علي الأكبر fights very bravely he fights them just like his grandfather علي بن أبي طالب his mother ليلى comes out of her tent she could not look at the battlefield she could only see the face of Aba Abdullah. All of a sudden, she saw the face of Imam Hussein became pale. He became worried. She said, Aba Abdullah, Hal Asaba Waladi Makruha. My master Aba Abdullah, has anything evil happened to my son? He said, No, but a fearless warrior has come out, and I fear for for my son Ali. And then he said, Ya Layla, go and pray for your son. Layla comes back into the tent. She faces the Qibla and she begins to pray. Ya Ilahi bi'atash abi abdullah Ilahi bi'gurbati abi abdullah Ya Radda Yusuf Ilahi Aqub 
رد إلي يا ولدي I ask you oh Allah by the thirst of Aba Abdullah I ask you oh Allah by the loneliness of Aba Abdullah oh the one who returned Yusuf to his father Yaqub returned my son Ali moments later Ali al-Akbar returned back to the tent he told him Aba Harr al-Hadid ajahadani العطش قد قتلني my father thirst is killing me this heavy armor is draining me Imam Hussein alayhi salam told him you have to go back and fight my son your grandfather will quench your thirst soon but first go and say your farewell to your mother Layla Layla is waiting for you Ali al-Akbar goes he says his farewell to his mother Layla and he goes back goes back to battle as Ali al-Akbar is fighting al Azdi hits him with his sword on his head Ali al-Akbar begins to bleed he bleeds everywhere and the blood covers the ice of the horse the horse instead of going back to the tent he takes him to the tent of the enemies they surround him they surround him from every direction and they began to cut him into pieces Ali al-Akbar shouts Aba alayka min salam Imam Hussein rushes to him to see what is remaining of his son Ali al-Akbar he sees his son he sees his son into pieces Imam Hussein alayhi salam comes down from his horse waladi ala dunya ba'dak al-afa my son Ali life is not worth remaining after you he comes to his son he puts his cheek on the cheeks of his son Ali al-Akbar he wants the sadness in his heart to calm down but that doesn't help Imam Hussein exposes his chest and he puts his chest on top of his the chest of Ali al-Akbar my son you're leaving waladi ala dunya ba'dak al-afa amma anta faqad istarahta min hamm al-dunya wa ghammiha wa banqayta abuka wahida Imam Hussein notices that Ali al-Akbar he would cry a little bit and he would smile a little bit Imam Hussein told him my son Ali why are you smiling and why are you crying he said my father when I smile I see my grandfather Rasulullah he's sitting beside me he's wanting to take me he wants to take me has a cup of water from heaven for me but I, when I look on the other side I see my grandmother Fatima beating her face and beating her chest Imam, Ali, Imam Hussein alayhi salam he gets up he gets up he cannot carry his son Ali al-Akbar he would carry one side other pieces fall he would carry the other pieces other pieces would fall he looked at the at Bani Hashim and he said oh Bani Hashim come and help me carry my son Ali al-Akbar la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah العلي العظيم إنا لله وإنا إليه راجعون وسيعلم الذين ظلموا أي منقلب ينقلبون نسألك اللهم وندعوك باسمك العلي الأعظم العز الجل الأكرم يا الله اللهم لا تدع لنا ذنبا إلا غفرته ولا هم إلا فرجت ولا عيبا إلا سترت ولا خوفا إلا منت ولا رزقا إلا بسطت ولا شملا إلا جمعت ولا مرضا إلا شفيت ولا غائبا إلا حفظته وأدنيت ولا حاجة من حوائج الدنيا والآخرة لك فيها رضا ولنا فيها صلاح إلا قضيتها ويسرتها يا أرحم الراحمين ولأرواح المؤمنين والمؤمنات والعلماء والشهداء نقرأ سورة 